Hello and welcome to Arts 24. Today on our program, we have a very special guest, American dancer and choreographer, Trajal Harrell. Thank you so much for joining us, Trajal. This is not actually your first time on France 24, is it? Uh, you were here on this same set 10 years ago uh, to talk about your voguing performance at the time you were performing that at the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris. You know France quite well now, right? Uh, yeah. Do you speak a bit of French? I speak a bit of French. I, I wouldn't say I'm fluent, but of course I speak a bit of French. Can I've you, been coming can here you say something, maybe? What can I say <laughs> in French? Oh, bonjour. <laughs> okay, well, you're back in the French capital this month for the Festival d'Automne. Uh, it's a contemporary art festival running through to the end of the year, and this year they're actually honoring you with a retrospective of uh, nine of your most eminent works, which you'll be reinterpreting or interpreting yes. yeah. uh, in nine, uh, ten spots in and around Paris. Now, one of those is the Romeo, which you already performed earlier this year at the Cour d'Honneur, uh, the most prestigious festival at the festival, uh, the most prestigious stage at the Festival d'Avignon. Take a look. What was it like performing on that hallowed stage? You know, it was it was wonderful to go to work there every day. I remember going to work there and just feeling like, wow, I get to work here. But it was a lot of pressure. Once you start performing, it's it's you realize why people call it the most prestigious prestigious stage in theater because it's quite challenging to 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 make it work on all the various different conditions that you have because it's outside the way you have to rehearse you have to rehearse late at night of course when the sun goes down mm. so but it was amazing i mean it, it, it felt like a graduation like i you know i got my doctorate <laughs> <laughs> you got the credibility yes 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 <laughs> And actually, it was interesting that that performance, there was a very unique interaction with the audience. At one stage, you invited them up onto the stage. You also were in part of the audience. You even yeah. sort of, in as a kind of tongue-in-cheek, you played Pink Floyd's um, Another Brick in the Wall. Mm -hmm. uh, why was it so important to break down this wall between you and the audience? Well, you know, I mean, there are two reasons I say. One is that, of course... My work, a lot of the things I do, you can talk about the, 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 the content of the work, but the main thing I'm interested in is togetherness, is I want people to feel the vitality of, of what it really means to be together in one room and to try to get on the same page together. That's when I think theater becomes alive, when we feel, although we may not be sure, but we feel that we're all in this thing kind of together, and I try to do that. And the second thing is, I just really love being with the people there, and I want to spend every minute with them. So we do these things that we greet the audience. And of course, it's a much bigger thing to greet and say goodbye to the people in the audience when there are 2,000 people in the seats. You know, how do you do this? And I think no one had ever done that at the Court of North, treated it so casually. It's one of the strategies in my work that we do. We always, we're there at the beginning saying hello to people. We do the thing that when you're a young kid in theater, they tell you, okay, when your mom or your friends come in, you don't say hello to them. We actually <laughs> you do, do it. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you go against pretty much every rule you've been told in yes. your training. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, we saw a bit of it in uh, that piece as well, Voguing, of course, which was inspired uh, by 1960s Harlem ball scene. It was the focus of your seminal eight-year project, 20 Looks or Paris is Burning at the Judson Church. Today, voguing is everywhere, isn't it? I mean, we've seen it in Beyonce's Renaissance concerts. We've seen it uh, with Madonna's concerts. It's even in t TV shows like RuPaul's Drag Race. How do you feel now that it's very mainstream? I think it's great. I mean, I, I think that it's great. It's been influencing mainstream for a long time, so it's good that it's getting the credit that it's due. But I don't think it ultimately... I think the great thing about vo the voguing ballroom scene is that they're so, um, they so value what they do in the community and winning trophies at competitions that it can't be co-opted. And I think that this is a wonderful thing about it, that it's great that it can benefit from the resources and the, the acknowledgement in the mainstream, but it hasn't really changed voguing at its heart. 
And um, now, you, after voguing, your, uh, you moved on to another movement, uh, the current movement, uh, which is your field of inspiration, which is buto. Mm -hmm. It's a type of Japanese dance. Can you tell us more about what this is and how it influenced your work? And why? Well, I mean, I think it was, you know, because voguing uses this operation of using fashion movement, I wanted attention with this. And so buto is, was, a, was a, a kind of underground dance form that was started in the 1950s in Japan, and 50s and 60s. And they were really trying to go back to traditional Japanese folk theater before it became kabuki and became kind of made into princes and, and, and samurais and this kind of thing. And they kind of went to the underbelly, the folk traditions. And so it's a lot about death and decay. It's a lot about um, things that, you know, this kind of wabi-sabi of Japanese, this kind of aesthetic of Japanese culture, things that, are, things that are falling apart, things that are dying and decaying, how this can also be a b part of the beauty of life. And so for me, it was, a, and, and, and a, if you brought, take a broad stroke aesthetically, it has more interest in something we may term ugliness, let's say, right? So I wanted attention with the work, this kind of, from the fashion, this kind of glamour and beauty, I wanted something as attention to it, so I use it in the work this way. Okay, so kind of honoring the underside of yes, that, if you like. Yes, yes, yes. Now, at the Festival d'Auton, you're not just reinterpreting or interpreting old works, you're also performing a new piece called Tambourines. Yes. Um, it's inspired by Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, book, The Scarlet Letter. Tell us a bit more about that. Well, we just finished it on um, Saturday, I believe it was. Yes, it's a piece I did in, in three parts. Um, I wanted to, this, this a character, Hester Prynne, is very well known in the United States. She's known as one of the most important female protagonists in American literature, about a woman who, um, in the 17th century United States, has a child uh, by a man who's not her husband. Her husband has gone away. And they make her wear an A on her clothing outside everywhere. So, of course, for me, it's, it's a beautiful story about clothing, yeah. about what we wear. But it's also an interesting story about um, a woman's identity, about community, about society, about faith. And I wanted to try to recover her. I wanted to, so I try in this piece to use the historical imagination to actually give her a community of support. I say, well, what would have happened if she wasn't alone, if she actually had other women around her who were supporting her? So instead of being ostracized, she was actually supported by a yes. network. Now, um, you became director of Zurich's Schaus Peel House Dance Ensemble in 2019. I mean, you are first and foremost a choreographer and dancer. What are the challenges of managing a company, a troupe like that? Yes. Um, well, of course, there are different, you know, I was independent for many years before, and there are many things that come with the institution. I, I mean, wonderfully, at the Shots we have 330 people working. And so all of a sudden, all the decisions you used to make alone you have to make, you have to negotiate, you have to negotiate schedules, you have to negotiate when you perform, you have to negotiate who's performing, you have to negotiate the guests that you bring in. So it's a lot of, of negotiating, I would say, that I had to, <laughs> to, to learn about. And also to, to, to realize how important it is in some ways that you get those other people on board with you. It's important. Well, you perform uh, several of your works with the Schauspiel House Dance Ensemble at the Festival d'Automne in Paris. One of them, one of those pieces is the Kuhn concert, which was inspired by American jazz pianist Keith Jarrett's per performance back in 1975. Take a look. Shoshal, you've said, um, well, your focus on Japanese buto has spanned a decade. You yourself have said, uh, have, has said that it'll be coming to an end soon. What's next for you, personally and professionally? I don't know, you know. <laughs> I want to spend, as I just told I want to spend time with my family and friends and partner. 
Um, I, I just recently did a, a performance. I had to, 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 I recently did a performance at the Karl Lagerfeld Library. I don't know if you know, but Karl Lagerfeld left a library of 33,000 books behind 7L, and it's part of Festival de Ton. I did a performance there. It was supposed to be a one-off. It was a kind of a one-off something that was not meant to, to last. And it was a really great performance. Yeah. But I'm not sure what I did or how I did it. So I think I might spend the next 10 years trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> you might need to take a step away then, yes, maybe. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I read maybe you might go into studies, perhaps. Is that something that... Well, I, certainly after me, I, I, would like to, I would like to get my master's in disability studies. I, I do want a second act in my career. I would like that um, after I finish choreographing, I do something else to contribute to the world. I would like another job. I, I mean, I'm looking at you like you have a pretty good job here. <laughs> you, would you like to, to maybe, host this? Maybe, maybe. It's nice Are you to, tempted? <laughs> to talk about culture with people. Yeah, it is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, look, you're constantly pushing the envelope in, in dance. Two years ago, you put on a performance at Paris's Fondation Cartier, paying tribute to your friend who was an exhibiting artist at the time, Sarah Z. Your ensemble danced non-stop for six hours interpreting your works on a loop using the changing light from day to dusk tonight shall we maybe yeah. leave our viewers with a with a little uh, sneak peek at that yes yeah? well look at this this is um well, we will leave you with a look at that performance this is Trajal Harrell's a friend of a friend thank you so much for coming on set to talk to us today thank you, for having thank me. you so much for watching France 24 more news coming up after this Hi, I'm Anthony Mills, Vienna correspondent for France 24. There's more to Austria than mountains, lakes and coffee houses, as wonderful as they are. Vienna is a seat of the United Nations and hosts international organizations, so there's plenty of high-profile diplomacy to cover. And every now and then, Austrian national politics goes global. Anthony Mills, one of the 200 France 24 correspondents around the world. <laughs>